Today we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a part of the glorious bride of Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll begin to dive into his word. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. You are our king. And today as we even sang songs like, I am a child of God, we are exceptionally cognizant of the fact that you love us so much that you would die, that we might have life and eternity with you. In fact, you died for your bride. You died for the church. You died that the kingdom of God might be advanced. And Lord, we hold that responsibility very near and dear to our heart. We want to live a life that would advance the kingdom of God. We want to understand what it means to be a member of your family. We want to understand how that should be applied to our life, how, should, how we should live it out each and every day. So, Lord, as we dive into this subject today, would you use it as an opportunity to refine our faith, maybe redefine our thinking if it needs redefinition, and just help us to live the things out that we're talking about in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. So I wanted to call this series, What Does It Mean to Be a Member of the Church? And Mary Jo said, that sounds way too boring. Nobody will show up if we call it that. But really, at a deeper level, in a regard, that's what we're talking about today. Should you be a member of a church? Is it important to be a member of a church? Are you called to be a member of a church? Are you supposed to be a member of a church or not, right? What does it mean to be a part of the bride of Christ? The, the bride of Christ is analogized in so many different ways, or the family of God. It's, it's analogized as a family, and we sing songs like we did today where I am a child of God. I'm part of the family of God. It's analogized as a bride. It's also analogized as an army. We see Jesus as the lion and the lamb, and we need to really expose all the different facets of it. We certainly won't have enough time to do it today and next week. Today, I'm going to deal with a little bit more of the more difficult and challenging portions of what it means, and tomorrow or next week with the Mother's Day, we'll do all the fun, fluffy, lovey stuff. Come on, Jesus. You guys ready for that? See, families have both sides, like healthy families, right? They have a degree of discipline and love and care and obedience that's part of a healthy family. And then there should be that overwhelming just love that exists inside of a family. So we will explore today and next week all those different facets. So today might also be a little bit of a redefinition of what it means to be a member of a church because I think in some ways that subject material has been hijacked to a degree, right? When we think of membership today, there's a membership for everything, is there not? Some of you on your keychains, you probably got like 50 different plastic things that are hanging off your keychains. You could be a member of the gas club, right? You get your gas at a place. You could be a member of the Sam's Club, right? You could be a member of a travel club. You could be a member of a credit union. You could be a member. The, me the word member is so diluted, it goes all the way back to maybe the old American Express uh, commercials. Does anybody remember what that used to say? If your old uh, membership has what? All right, come on, Jesus. We are a multi-generational church. So for you young people, it said membership has its privileges. And certainly there's aspects of living in the kingdom of God that uh, should conform with that, could, should conform with the fact that membership has its privileges. But there's also a distortion of it because when we think of membership in a modern day society, don't we kind of take it or leave it since it's everywhere? Like one day you're a member of Sam's Club and then when they open the new Costco about a year from now, some of y'all are going to switch and you're going to start to go to the Costco instead of the Sam's Club, right? So you were a member until they put the new one up on the other corner. Come on, Jesus, right? There's going to be some church analogies. We will draw to that in just a few moments. We're going to talk about that as part of today's message, right? So when we, we think about that, we, we maybe come and go when it comes to this earthly um, sense of what membership is all about, but there's part of that that should not be applied to the church, you know? So there's been some beautiful things in the past 30 years of Christianity. Uh, one term that came about that maybe has some beauty to it, but also has some distortions to it, is church shopping. Some of y'all may be shopping up in here today, right? You're a visitor, you're coming, you're trying to check it out, you're trying to see if this is the church for you. That is absolutely okay to a degree. Maybe you come into a new city, you come into a new area, you shop around, so to speak, asking for the Holy Spirit to conform or confirm in your heart, is this the place that you're supposed to be or not? Um, when taken to the extreme, though, when it's all about the next new shiny thing, like we do in marketing sometimes, like I got to have the new phone, or I got to have the new car, or I got to have the next new thing, then maybe that analogy begins to break down when it comes to a church. Because it's not about the next new thing all the time. There's these other two words that we need to learn during the course of today's message called being sent and being called. 
These are biblical terms. So there's a degree to each of these things that I'm talking about, membership or church shopping, that is absolutely awesome and wonderful when kept in context. But when you begin to distort those things and you do them out of a sense of being called or sent, that's when it can actually become sin, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit today as well. There's a lot of things to talk about here. See, Christ maybe had some different things in mind when it came to being a part of his family than we traditionally think about. So this word ecclesia that we named the church after is one of the, not the church after, the series after, ecclesia. What does the word ecclesia mean? In a very base sense, in the society that they were living in at that time, the word ecclesia was referring to the ruling body in Greece. It was the ultimate governmental authority on earth in the country of Greece during that particular time. So the very technical aspect of it meant a ruling authoritative authoritative body. Um, In an earthly sense, sadly, many authoritarian bodies and governments become corrupt, do they not, right? Not so with Christ's bride, although we are made of human beings and we have sinfulness and faults and issues, the bride itself as given and birthed by Jesus Christ is perfect and spotless and we all have a job to advance it. So the word ecclesia technically is like a military term. So when you think of the body of Christ, you can't get around that aspect of it either. Yes, there's the lovey-dovey, wonderful parts of it, but there's also this spiritual authority that exists in and through the body of Christ that we often fail to realize here in United States Christianity. But it's something that exists and should exist maybe even to a greater degree. So the, the, the term when used in Christianity, ecclesia, technically means the called out ones. You were called out of darkness into his glorious light. You were called from sin to become a believer in Jesus Christ. It says he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He called you to be a part of his family. Think about that for a moment. How important, how awesome, how wonderful that is. Because y'all are just as jacked up as I am. And he still loves you. And he cares for you. And he wanted you to be a part of his family. Some of us were like the last kid picked on the field. Come on, Jesus, right? (laughs) He chose you first before you were even formed in your mother's womb. He loved you that much. He wanted you to be a part of his family. You are part of the called out ones, princes, daughters of God, sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords. May we wield it in that way. There's another word. We've been learning some new definitions. There's another word I want you to learn today, and it is called imperium. It's not a word that we hear very often here in the United States. We have an elected government. We um, don't think of terms like this. But what this word imperium imperium means is supreme power or absolute dominion. It is where the buck stops in society, right? Sometimes wield in a good way and sometimes wield it in a terrible way. I saw a brief uh, documentary about Saddam Hussein and his son Uday. And Uday was a hot mess, psychopathic killer. I mean, he was just a brutal, brutal, awful person, raped women, shot and killed whoever he want, did whatever he want, because his dad at that particular season and time was the Imperium. He was the supreme authority in Iraq, and it was wielded in a God-awful way. We can't look at some of these terms and think about the bad side of them. We need to look at them and think about the good side of them because ultimately Christ is imperium. He rules and reigns with all authority and the bride of Christ is supposed to do the same. The bride of Christ is supposed to be dictating what is going on in America, in the world. We are supposed to be the ones that are standing out. We're the ones that are supposed to be the shot callers. Why do we subjugate that authority to everybody else? So this is a military group. You were called out of darkness into the light. Do you think of all the kingdom analogies that you hear in the Bible? We are in a day and age where the kingdoms are warring against each other and the Satan is after trying to still kill and destroy the body of Christ. He doesn't want to see the kingdom of God advance. So we're looking at these different sides of the jewels. You're enlisted in the army. Every one of you are in the army, navy, marines, air force, 
We got that coming up for Memorial Weekend. Some of you all didn't want to join the army. You didn't want to be drafted, but that's what it means to be called. You're called. You're the called out ones. He wants us to live differently. We're to walk and talk and act with spiritual authority. It says what you bind in heaven is bound on earth. When's the last time you used that authority, right? Maybe some of these things are new to you. Maybe they're not. Maybe you forgot about them. Would we start to live them out again? Can I get an amen? amen? So who is the authority of authorities to which all must answer? Here in the United States, many would say it's the state, right? It is not the state. It is ultimately Jesus Christ, and ultimately it should be his church. There's a reality found in Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give account of himself to God. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is imperium, right? Do you know that there's scriptures that say one day you will rule and reign with him in heavenly places as believers in Jesus Christ? That you will be the judge, so to speak. He will be the ultimate authority, but you will wield it with perfect loving kindness. How awesome is that? One day you're going to rule and reign. Why not start now? Why not learn what that means now to rule and reign and live and love in such a way as Christ would do it here on earth, not as any earthly dictator would do it, not as any sinful earthly man would do it, but the Bible says that you can live this way. Might we do so in our own generation as we acknowledge first and foremost that Jesus is the ultimate authority. His original intent is that the church would be the administrator of that imperium here on earth. Let's get one more thing out of the way as well. This word church inter- used interchangeably, right? So we talk about going to church. We know that we are the church, right? You and I are the church. Let's start with that simple definition. People distorted. I even saw a comment online. Inevitably, if I post something like I'm going to church, somebody would, I am the church. I'm wherever I go. I take myself. I'm not going to church because I am the church. Okay, we get that. But there's also this other verse found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, that says, do not forsake the gathering together of the saints. Christianity is not meant to be a lone ranger religion. So if you're watching online and you were the one, I love you dearly, but you've got that wrong. You cannot be out there all by yourself all the time. Yes, there's an aspect of that. We should be the church wherever we go. But in common English vernacular here in the United States, we call the gathering together of the saints the church. It's analogy, right? In other places, they are a little bit more finicky about it. Like if you go to Israel, you gather together as a congregation. It may be a better word to be used in that kind of a setting. But guess what? We are the church wherever we take ourselves. But you're to go to church too, like you have done this morning. I praise you for doing that in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. Thank you. We got that one out of there. Come on, Jesus. So today, like, we're doing this one at staff, like, get out every pet peeve. Please, go ahead, put them all in there in one week. Get them all over with. (laughs) Drop the mic before we go, right? (laughs) Get to church, people. Church online is cool, but if that's your only existence, that's not healthy. One author writes this. Today, most Christians think it's okay to attend a church indefinitely without joining. They often don't integrate their Monday through Saturday lives with church life and real Christianity. They think it's okay to be absent from the church gatherings many times per month or the other events trump what's going on or even make major decisions in life without considering the fact that those decisions on the family or on our church, much less the community, we don't understand what it means to be sent or called. So I think I agree with him. I agree with that author. I think we don't understand what it means to be sent or called at times in our life, um, myself included. I'll share a story about that a little bit later. God has a way of redeeming things, but I think sometimes we just don't get the gravity of where we're supposed to exist within the church in this context of Imperium. So the funny thing is, the kinds of messages when you share stuff like this, this is for the people who are in the empty seats, not for you guys who are here, right? Right? Isn't it funny how that always works out? You know, the people who have uh, struggling marriages are the ones who don't go to the marriage groups. Anybody listening? Come on, Jesus. 
the marriage groups are not just for the people with healthy marriages, they're for everybody, right? So these things I say, some are praise to you who are here, you're obviously getting it right, but there's also these cautions lest we forget. The author goes on to say that the basic disease behind all of the symptoms um, it, which I had, that he's talking about courses through his own veins is the assumption that we have authority to conduct our Christian lives as our own. Think about that at the very core of that for a moment. We live in a, a nation where maybe up until recently, it was all, I'm a self-made man, I'm a self-made woman. We, we do things on our own. We pride ourselves on our own successes. We pride ourselves on our own advances. We're a selfie generation. But he's saying, as believers, when you walk the aisle one day and you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you became a bondservant or slave to Christ. Your life is no longer your own. How many of you are in the military or were in the military? Raise your hands. You were military property for a season, were you not? They called the shots for you in your life, did they not? As any unhealthy organization, it might have been good or bad at certain times, but Christ wields it with perfect loving authority and dominion, right? But it doesn't get us around the fact that he could tell you what to do when he wants to tell you what to do. You said that one day, Lord, I will do anything. I will do everything. I will surrender all to you. You got my finances. You got my life. You got everything. And then all of a sudden, a year later, you're like, here's 2%, Jesus. I'm just tipping you, right? Here's this area of my life. I'm just tipping you. I'm giving you this, but not this. We're holding back, right? No, we are bond servants to the king of kings. Our lives are not our own. 1 Corinthians 7.22 says this, and remember If you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave to Christ. We were all in bondage to something. We all remain in bondage to some of the things of the world that we pray that God will help us overcome. But we are bondservants to the King of kings and Lord of lords. You were created and he created the church to rule and reign in heavenly places and here on earth. You were drafted or you are called slaves to Christ the day that we surrendered our lives to him for he has imperium. He is the King of kings. So when you think of churches, it's not something that you should just be coming or going on your own whim. It happens on both ends of the extreme. You, you, you could be just the average church member, so to speak, and you come and go on your own whim. Are you sure that's what God wants you to do? And the worst time to leave a church is if you're disgruntled. Now, say you're a leader and you come and go on your own whim. Guess what? You also orphan those underneath you who were looking up to you. you got to think these through because we're a family, Right? We're a family. We're supposed to love one another, endure with one another, help one another. When we see weaknesses like Moses, we cover one another and we help one another, right? We fill in the gaps when we see problems. We don't run from them. Maybe God brought you here to fill in whatever gap that you see missing within the church, right? Now, if a church is totally sick, totally sinful, totally distorted, you probably should run. But I don't think that that's what you got here at Journey Church. I think you got a loving group of leaders who are trying to do the right thing. Do we fall short from time to time? Oh, yes. But we do what we do out of love and with no other intention, I assure you that. Ephesians 4.1 further makes the point. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, he uses the word prisoner instead of slave, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, right? That's part of what we do in our own families, right? Isn't that what we're to do in the church family? We maintain unity, we love one another, we care for one another, we be there for one another, and we share those difficult things with one another. Some of the most humbling and horrific moments in my life were those areas where someone had to discipline me, but they were also the times of most growth. If we look back, maybe your life was the same, right? It did not feel good when that sting first hit you, did it? Come on, how many of y'all were in the, in the belt and go out to the tree age and get the stick off the tree and whoop you kind of thing? How many of y'all got whooped by a thistle or whatever they call those? Th- oh, you guys lived in Middleburg and Callahan and, and come on, Jesus. Us city dwellers were like, you can't spank your child. My mama needed to spank me a lot more than she did. I, I assure you that, right? 
God disciplines those he loves. And those are the most difficult moments when we face those kinds of things. But that is also an act of Christianity and of the church that is often overlooked. We rarely um, exhibit church discipline. Maybe we need to do it just a little bit more from time to time. But when it comes to a family, guess what? How many of y'all want to, if you you could raise your, how many of y'all want to leave your, your blood family from time to time? Come on, Jesus, right? I mean, like, but you can't, right? You love them. You grow with one another. You love it. And I just want to say, don't leave a church on a whim. Don't leave a church on a whim. And don't leave it because you're disgruntled here or anywhere else. Maybe you're even showing up here today because something happened at another church. Think this through and pray it through and make sure you are being sent to that place because as a believer, maybe God has you coming so that you could fill a gap or you're being called there for some reason. Don't just go hop from church to church to church because guess what? As I will repeat a couple times here today, you take yourself wherever you go. Let that one sink in for a minute. Do I need to say it again? Y'all, you take yourself wherever you go. You take yourself wherever you go. If you are called to a place and you know it's where God wants you, help with everything that you have within you to make that bride more beautiful. Your presence and your service make that church better. In fact, if you are called to leave, and all of you will be called to leave here someday. Look at the Bible. Look what happened when they sent them out. They went from city to city. They were there for a short time. They were equipped, and then oftentimes God sent them on another place to continue to do it. We pray that we are a big sending church that goes and sends people all over the world that are equipped. But while you're here, make a a thing in your heart that I'm going to do whatever I can to leave this place better than when I first got here. I'm going to fill in the gap, I'm going to help, I'm going to lead, I'm going to be there, and we're going to make it better than when we first got here. Some people are called here for a long time, some people are called here for a short time, but when they're living, sent, or called, they're always here for the right time. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's talk where the rubber hits the road as an example. I'll give an example of my own life, and then we're going to talk about this aspect of church discipline and sin for just a moment. Um, so sent and called, just to try to bring it home. If you've been here for some time, you, you've heard this story before, but maybe you'll hear it afresh. So God, I start this by saying God has a way of redeeming even our mistakes. But I don't like to live in those miracle places unless I have to. So what do I mean by that, to use another analogy? So say your marriage is starting to have a little bit of trouble. Oftentimes people wait until the fact that they need a miracle to salvage their marriage before they come talk to Pastor Don and the spiritual growth and development team, Right? You don't need a miracle. Sometimes like your finances, you you wait until it's that last day and you're calling us on the phone like, they're going to take my house today if I don't do it. You knew they were going to take your house three months ago. Why didn't you call us before you needed a miracle, right? So some areas in life, I don't want you to have to live with a miracle. This is one of them. So for in my younger days, I looked to money as a God, right? I looked to my job as a, as a God. I wanted to be the best. I wanted to reach the pinnacle of my career. And we were in a wonderful church in South Florida that we grew up in from the time that the church had 300 people. At that time, it was like four or 5,000. It was a crazy experience. We got to be a part of it. We were in leadership there. It was incredible, but I, I wanted a different job. And I got a job up here in Jacksonville. And in 2000, um, everybody in Miami, when you'd ask him about Jacksonville, do you know what they used to say? Isn't that smelly place you drive through on your way to like North Carolina when you're from Miami? Like all the, I guess the mills used to be here. So uh, we, we made a decision in our hearts. We didn't consult the church. We didn't talk to the leadership. We didn't talk to the pastors. We were in leadership. We didn't talk to them. We just came to them one day. Oh, I got a job. I'm going. You know, and then, you know, they sat us down and they loved us and they said, okay, well, you got a job. Do you got a church? And we're like, We're going to the Bible Belt. Come on, man. You don't need to worry. There's a white steeple on every single corner up there, right? So we got here in three and a half years of purgatory here on earth, so to speak, before we found the church where we really felt God calling us to and leading us into a place where we could grow and and begin to do it. And we could have avoided maybe three and a half years of purgatory had we listened to the pastors or engaged them earlier in the conversation. If they are not just the pastors, but the leadership of the church, the leaders of our small group, the people that God puts in positions of authority over you. See, most people bail and you don't even hear about it. Occasionally, you get a few that will come to you and say, I feel God calling me or sending me. How do you know if they really did it right or not? 
if they ain't telling nobody, chances are it didn't do it right. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? (laughs) So back to my story, like we could have probably avoided a lot of pain by doing that. Now, did God have a way of redeeming that later? Yes, he does. So even in our own sinfulness, when we make decisions on our own and we don't seek the wisdom and counsel of others, God can still redeem that story. But is that the way you want to live all the time? Or would you rather live in his will? See, the Bible says there is wisdom in the counsel of many. It says that you can bring not just the decision of what church to come and go to, but that was a job decision. You know, God, I would never, ever go seek out another job, so to speak, now without going and talking to brothers and sisters in Christ whom I love and who love me. Would we be open about that kind of stuff with our family, with our relationships? With, that's what a church family is. God's put people in authority over you for a reason, but we don't even trust authority here in America anymore. Even go back to respect. This isn't for me, believe me, but there was a day where people respected pastors. People disrespect you online. They don't care what my authority is or not. But if what the Bible says is true, I don't want the authority that God's given me. But for whatever reason, God puts authority through leadership and different things for a reason. Now, do we make mistakes? Yes. But would we disrespect any brother or sister in Christ like that? I would hope not, right? But think about these things because our generation corrupts some of them. Maybe we need to think about them a little bit differently. I don't go around and have people call me Pastor Eric. Everybody calls me Eric, right? But maybe there is something to those churches where they sometimes go and say pastor or different things of that nature. There's a respect. There's authority that's given in Christ Jesus in Scripture, right? We need to learn about these kinds of things and apply them in our life in a very respectful way so that we could avoid some of these things. Can I get an amen? Bishop. Bishop. Oh, the reverse is true. If you take on titles for title's sake, I mean, gosh, it gets, Christians are weird, dude. Leader Christians are weird, too. If you have to call yourself an evangelist or you have to call yourself a bishop or if you have to call yourself an apostle, chances are you're not. Let that one sink in for a minute, right? <laughs> if you carry that office, people are going to know it. It's going to be evident. You don't have to call yourself something. They walk in that authority in Christ Jesus. Now, you just caused me to go off the deep end, brother. (laughs) All right, now let's deal with the big one, capital S, sin, right? So if the church is supposed to be a place of authority, wielded in the right way, in love, not wanting to hurt anybody as leaders, right? Should not we deal with sin from time to time? Should we not confront those issues from time to time in a loving, God-fearing way? Because we read earlier in Scripture that God calls his bride to be pure. He calls her to do all that we can as representatives of his bride to live a life that's worthy of the calling of being called believers in Jesus Christ, right? How far off the schedule? I'm, I'm doing halfway decent. All right. My heart breaks over this issue because we've had to deal with it a lot more than I have thought lately. Just being completely honest with you. There's a couple things that happen. Somebody sins, nine times out of ten, they bail. You don't even get to talk to them. You don't even get to have that conversation. One, they may not see us as a spiritual authority for whatever reason. They don't see church in the way that God intended it. Um, They want to continue on in their sin. So most oftentimes, they just disappear. You don't even see them. They go on in their sin. But if we were to add two or three other scenarios into there, so the second scenario is um, a sin becomes somewhat public, and you need to begin to have a conversation about that so the leadership gets involved, it's been brought to our attention. Um, You go and you have that conversation, and inevitably a couple of different things happen. So you usually have the conversation, and even at times while you're in the very room, it sounds like the conversation went exceptionally well. You're dealing with whatever sin it might be. You're having this conversation, the person's like, yep, yep, they know all the biblical things to say, and I've learned to never judge a meeting until like a few days after the meeting. Because what happens is you leave, you're like, that went pretty good. Felt like they really got it. It felt like they're trying to do it, and then all of a sudden you're unfriended on Facebook. (laughs) You hurt my feelings, you unfriended me, oh my gosh. You unfriend me on Facebook, you won't return my texts anymore. You go on and you do whatever that sin is that you want to do, sadly, because your heart is hardened. Mary Jo, like say, take an issue of lust is one. Mary Jo calls it the lust bubble. People make some dumb decisions when under the influence of the lust bubble. 
They go and they do some dumb, dumb things, and they won't listen. They won't hear the wisdom. Like, I can go all the way back. We had a youth pastor that was here in the very early days of Journey Church, and uh, there was another guy, Brian and I. We loved this guy dearly. We were not after his girl. We both had great wives. I mean, come on, Jesus. This guy was leading our youth, and we lovingly approached him and said, man, you know, there was a girl that had come into his life that he entered a lust bubble over, and he's like wanting to marry her within a month and doing all this. We're like, dude, it's too fast. God wants you to wait some time. You got to do some due diligence or you might marry crazy. Come on, Jesus, in both directions, man or woman. God puts that buffer there for a reason, right? So we lovingly tell this guy, like, you know, please don't do this. We plead with you. We love you. You're going to lose your job. It's, it may not go well, but that person was determined. They ended up getting married within like 90 days of meeting this person. They ignored the counsel of others. They ignored the wisdom that we had. That girl left him like two weeks after they got married. Lost his job, lost the girl, lost everything. We're like, man, the, the, we don't rejoice over that. My heart breaks over that. Any of these kinds of situations where we don't confront people on things that are deemed sinful by Scripture because we want to hurt you in any way. We do it because we love you and want to see you avoid the pains that we're talking about. We love you dearly. So these are the kinds of things that we do need to talk about. So we make light of it, but we have a saying, sadly, that the stereotype has become a reality. What happens is when confronted over an issue, people either grow or they go. They grow or they go. And guess what? Like I said earlier, you take yourself wherever you go. If you have an issue, whatever that issue might be, and God's using that moment as a test for you to try to get you to grow, and you avoid it like going and putting the leaves on you like Adam and Eve did, and you're going to run from one bush to another, and you say, okay, this week I'm going to elevate life. Woo, hallelujah, Jesus, right? Next week, I'm going to celebration. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Next week, you go there. But what happens is all of a sudden, God's going to catch up with you one day because he loves you so much that he doesn't grade on a curve. He will keep hounding you and hounding you and hounding you no matter how far you run until you pass that test because he loves you. It's better yet to deal with whatever those issues are in the context of people who love you. It's called the church. It's called the church. We didn't wake up one day and say, oh, we're going to have this job so we can hurt people. So here's the third thing that inevitably happens. We confront them, and then all of a sudden, Eric is a demon. <laughs> I'm telling you, every time. I'm the bad guy. I'm this. I'm that. Talk bad about me on Facebook. Unfriend me. Do whatever. Every time. This church stinks. No, you have an issue, and we loved you enough to tell you about it, and now you're going to go out there and tell everybody we stink? You're the one who's got stinking sin going on in your life that needs help. But other people around you don't love you enough to tell you. Lord, would he put people around us who love us enough to tell us, even when that sting hurts at first, would it help us grow to be the people that he would have us be? Can I get an amen? amen. So let me tell you about one final situation. Occasionally in it's a miracle when it happens, sadly. I wish it were the standard. Occasionally, occasionally, people listen. They change. God does a miracle in their life. They usually go on to be leaders in the church. I can tell you time and time again, when confronted by that, because it's seemingly, sadly, so rare in our society, when confronted by that, man, God does something special in their humble repentance and ends up using them to do powerful, powerful things for the kingdom of God. May that be all of our stories. So we're confronted in love. Would God's Holy Spirit touch us, change us, and make us into the people he would have us be? We're part of a loving family that I believe is instilled with spiritual authority, birthed by God, with wisdom for living. He wants us to live called. He wants us to live sent. He wants us to live in loving submission and authority to one another and to his word. Man, when you find a church like that, I pray you would embrace it. Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Man, God is a good God, is he not? Yes. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I, I look back at my own life and 
I can certainly remember those moments where I was lovingly approached about sin in my life, about a need for change. I'm so grateful you put those people in my life who love me enough to intervene in such a way, to point me towards scripture, to lead me towards righteousness. I come before you first and foremost to ask for forgiveness for the moments that I tried to go at it alone and by myself when you've so lovingly positioned a church family around me, Lord God, people that you've given wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to by the power of the Holy Spirit, forgive me for the moments in my life where I rejected their counsel and I tried to go out on my own. Lord, just forgive me. Father, on the other hand, I do thank you for the breakthroughs that I've received when I was willing to say yes. I've got a problem, yes, I've got issues, yes, I need help. When I raised the white flag of surrender and you moved in and did what only you could do, I pray we would experience many more moments like that here at Journey Church, where those miracles of lives transformed through humble submission and repentance would become the norm here at Journey Church. I've seen far too many people just go, Lord God. My heart breaks not because we've lost a member, Lord God. My heart breaks because I know with all my heart, strength, soul, and mind that they're probably headed for destruction. Lord, we pray for those wayward sons and daughters who truly are children of the King. Those prodigals who are out there, we all know them. Some of us might be them right at this very moment, Lord. We pray for them and we ask you to bring them home. The thing I love about that prodigal story is you go running out to them, Lord God. May we be a people, may we be a family that would run out from these doors and express your love, your kindness, and your care to everyone that we encounter. So many have been hurt by church, Lord God. I doubt those pastors ever intended that, but in our own fallenness and sinfulness, we know that sometimes it happens. And Lord... We pray for the many here at Journey who we've inadvertently hurt by no intention of our own. Father, we ask for forgiveness for those moments where maybe we erred in the way that we loved and cared for your bride. So Lord, at this very moment, I pray that you just pour out a spirit of love, mercy, compassion on your body. Prepare our hearts even now for next week, Lord God, when we gather together on Mother's Day. We celebrate all the good parts of being your family. Lord, we got the discipline part out of the way. We got the authority part out of the way. May we walk in those things today. But maybe there's some of you who are here today that you've heard this message and it's resonated with your heart in a new way. And maybe you've realized that you've been trying to go at it on your own. But today God's calling you home. He's calling you either maybe for the first time to become a member of his family. You realize just how much he loves you that he's more than willing to die to cover your sin. Or maybe you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Your salvation is secured. You know it, but for whatever reason, you've been going at it on your own, and today's the day you need to kind of return home to the King of kings and Lord of lords. If that's you, would you do me a huge favor? Just raise your hand up real high. I would love to pray for you. Anybody need to dedicate or rededicate their lives to Jesus today? Is there anybody here? today. Lord, we thank you for moving. We thank you for your power and your authority. As we leave this place today, would we walk in it? Would we realize that we are part of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart unto God to live, love, serve, and advance the kingdom of God in our generation? So as we walk from these doors, would we do so by living on mission? Would we tell the world about you and what you've done in our lives, Lord God? Would we not be content by living life that's normal in Christian terms of today's standards, Lord God. But would we live as sold out bond servants for you? We love you, Jesus, we praise you. May our lives be a reflection of the beautiful bride of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you guys, have a wonderful day.